So stop me, please, because James is a book that gets me really excited. So it's one thing to reference a verse from James, but now we've just turned to James. I only want to read one verse, so stop me from just getting into James so much that we miss out on Amos. James chapter 5, verse 10. James is referred to as the Proverbs of the New Testament. Why? Because just like the book of Proverbs, each verse is just an antidote, a practical antidote for life. It's just practical wisdom. You know, it says if you say to a person that's in need, hey, go have a great day, go get warm and go have a good meal, but you don't give them any means to get that meal or give them the coat to actually warm themselves, recognizing how in need they are, how does the love of God dwell in you? It's just very practical stuff. It says, don't be a respecter of persons. One guy comes in the church or one gal and they're dressed like they have money and like they're a person seemingly of influence. So you tell them, hey, go sit in the front row. Another person comes in and seemingly has nothing. And you kind of say, hey, just sit wherever. It says, do not be a respecter of persons. James gives practical wisdom. Here's another piece of that practical wisdom in James 5.10. It says, take my brethren, the prophets, referring to the Old Testament prophets. There are 16 books in the Old Testament that are the prophetic books. And it's saying here, don't just study the prophecies, which are many, but take their lives. Take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. The Greek word for patience isn't just waiting for the bus, but waiting for the bus after you've been splashed with frozen, muddy slush, uh, and you're freezing. It's waiting while you're under a tremendous burden. So we're told here with this practical wisdom, don't just study their prophecies, but study their personal lives. And in studying their personal lives, as you look at how they endured affliction, endure trials, you will be encouraged to endure. If there's one thing the church needs to be instructed in over and over again, especially in this day where we live in such a quitter culture, we live in such a every kid gets a trophy culture, uh, the day that we're in and the world's culture has very much infused the church culture, we need to study how to endure and how to persevere now, more than perhaps any other time in church history, just think of what a quitter culture it is, you know? Reminds you of the story of the man on the island. They show up to finally rescue him, and they see three huts. They basically said, wait a minute, it's just you on the island. He said, yeah. He said, are you sure it's just you? He said, yeah, it's just me. I'm just stranded on this island. Well, why are there three huts? He said, well, the first hut is the one I live in. They said, oh, okay, well, what's the second hut? Well, that's my church I go to. They said, well, well, what's the third hut then? That's my old church. I don't go to that one anymore. <laughs> you know, what it's teaching, and you get it already, is that even a man on an island by himself will be able to find a reason to quit one church, you know, or quit one thing and go to another, even if there's no one to argue with, you know? So all that being said, and we can go on and on with that, James 5.10 is saying, hey, the remedy for this day. Even Jesus said that when he returns, would he even find faith? Luke 18. Matthew 24, 12, Jesus says in the last days, the love of believers would get cold. It says in Matthew 25 that believers would no longer be looking for the Lord's return. Don't we see all of this? The Bible makes clear that in the last days, and these are them, faith would be in crisis among God's people, not among the world. Love would be in crisis among God's people, not in the world, and that hope would be in crisis. The remedy is what the remedy always is and always will be. The remedy is the word of God. And James 5.10 comes in and says, study the prophets. Study Jeremiah's personal life. Study Isaiah's personal life. Daniel's personal life. Hosea's personal life. Hence, for the last, I don't know, two months now, we've been studying the prophets chronologically Today we are at Amos, so let's please turn to Amos. Amos is an interesting brother, as are all of the prophets, as are all of us when we start to hear one another's stories, all of us uh, beautifully unique in our own ways. Amos is an unlikely man called to do an amazing thing. 
Unlikely, meaning no one would have predicted it. You know, you look at Ezekiel's life. The way God used Ezekiel, the way God stretched Ezekiel, the things Ezekiel endured, wow, who can even wrap their mind around it? Only God in a person's life could allow uh, that kind of life to be lived. But when we look at Ezekiel's background, I don't think we're as surprised, based on the world's way of thinking, that Ezekiel was the man called to the job. He was already a priest. He was already influential. He already had the respect of his peers. So even though his ministry was very hard, at least when we see him engage in ministry, no one's surprised. Just like when you see a child always dribbling a basketball, everywhere they go, they're dribbling a basketball or dribbling a soccer ball, you know, because we're an international church, we got to talk about the, the, the best sport in, on the planet right now. I'm only, all right, you get my point. But you're not surprised when you see them as an adult playing soccer or playing basketball because Ezekiel was raised in that training as a priest. You're not surprised to see him as a prophet. But you know what Amos was? Amos was a fig picker. He says it himself. Go to chapter 7 of Amos. Amos chapter 7. And let's look at verses 14 and 15. Amos 7, 14 and 15. It says, Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet. Neither was I a prophet's son. He's saying, I have had no formalized theological training. Neither did my dad or anyone in my family. He said, I was a herdsman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. Now, we're familiar here on the East Coast and in the Northeast with a sycamore tree. But sycamore trees don't bear fruit. Basically, it's a Middle Eastern, it's a species of a fig tree. So he's basically saying, I had no formalized theological training. I only know people who live in my small little farming community. Matter of fact, I just gather and harvest figs. I just pick figs. I pick figs for a living. And then it says in verse 15, but the Lord took me as I was following the flock. There was a day when I was in my small little corner doing my regularly scheduled program of picking figs. This is a person who knew no one except for who was in his community. If he had a Facebook page, he might have had 12 friends. <laughs> Truth be told, nothing wrong with that. It just means that he was in a small part of town. Amos chapter 1 is going to tell us where he's from. That's how we know that. If he had a Facebook page, he would have probably had 12 friends. If he had a Twitter account, you know, he probably would have been followed by maybe two or three people. No theological training. He's not trendy. He does not know metropolitan culture. No education outside of to be a farmer and to pick figs. And one day he's following the flock and God calls him to do something that really is different than what anyone else has been called to do in the scriptures. He says, the Lord took me as I followed the flock and the Lord said to me, go. That's all that matters. God sees him. God calls him. God does not look at man the way man looks at man. Man looks on the outside. Man looks at the fig leaves, at the trappings, at the resume, you know, and all these different things. It says man looks on the outside, but what does God look at? God looks at the heart. Second Chronicles 16, 9 says the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. What's he looking for? Who, who man says is popular? Who man puts on a pedestal? No, he says he's looking for hearts. And not just hearts, but hearts that are sold out for him. He's not looking for ability because God owns all ability. He's looking for te teachable, humble hearts. And he's looking for availability. And he sees this in this place called Tekoa with a man named Amos. Let's go to Amos chapter one. Amos means burden bearer. God is going to give him a tremendous burden. It says in Amos one verse one, the words of Amos who was among the herdmen of Tekoa. In the days, or I'm sorry, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. 
for one, I love it when the Bible does these things like just mentions that an earthquake took place. I don't know which earthquake it is. Obviously, it was one that all of Israel knew about. But little things like this just kind of tickle me and remind me that what we're reading is not only the word of God, but it is a historical document. This was a real earthquake, and it's saying, yeah, actually, he began his ministry two years before the earthquake. Which earthquake? The earthquake everybody back then knew about. His ministry lasted about 40 years. If you want to write this down, it was roughly between 793 and 753 BC. How do we know that? Because it said he was prophesying during the days of King Uzziah and during the days of Jeroboam. He's from Tekoa. Tekoa was about five miles from Bethlehem, about 10 miles from Jerusalem. It actually was in the middle of nowhere. You get the impression that to go there was to see nothing but just fig orchards and just beasts of the desert, the rattlesnake, the viper, and all different things. And basically, Tekoa sat on this cliff. And if anyone's been to Israel, and I had the pleasure of going about 10 years ago, when you get in that Dead Sea region, there is nothing. And Tekoa actually was situated right near the Dead Sea. So we're actually from Tekoa. You could see the Dead Sea. Not only did he grow up seeing that, but remember, that's right near where Sodom and Gomorrah was judged. And I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Let me back up and give a little bit of history so we see just what time period he's ministering in. He's also ministering about 40 years after Elijah and Elisha had performed all of their miracles. As you guys remember, David was the man after God's own heart, right? David was the king over all of Israel, yes? After David, he was succeeded by his son. His son's name was Solomon, right? Solomon was given a blank check from God and God told him, Solomon, you can have anything you desire. Solomon said, well, with a people that are as great as your people, Lord, I don't want to let them down. I'm asking for wisdom. The Lord says to Solomon, because you didn't ask for fame, because you didn't ask for riches, but because you asked for wisdom, you will be the wisest man, you know, to walk the earth. Solomon had tremendous wisdom, but his heart still went after idolatry. He multiplied many wives, uh, worshipped so much on the demonic side of things that you have some Christians that actually try to say that they don't think Solomon is even in heaven. I believe it's very clear that Solomon came back to the Lord because you see at the end of Ecclesiastes, after writing about that idolatrous demonic journey, you know, he says, let's conclude the whole matter Fear God and keep his commandments. So he obviously came back. Plus, Jesus references him in the Sermon on the Mount and actually speaks with him, you know, with a compliment, you know. Um, so after Solomon, remember, there was a split. Solomon's son was Rehoboam. Then there was another contemporary named Jeroboam. You know, the Bible says one sinner can destroy a lot of good. Just one. One match can start a forest fire. One sinner can destroy a lot of good. What Jeroboam did, remember there were 12 tribes of Israel. Jeroboam convinced 10 of the 12 tribes to go with him to the northern part, totally separating from Judah, totally separating from Benjamin, right? And they set up their own center of worship, moved it away from Jerusalem, moved it up to Samaria. He erected a golden calf, set up a whole different system, and even wouldn't even allow people to go back to Jerusalem because, of course, this was a man-driven thing. He did not want people going to Jerusalem because he didn't want people going and waking up to the truth. So in the Bible, when you see Israel, that's referring to the 10 tribes that went north. It was grounded in idolatry. It was founded by compromising the Bible and idolatry. So when you see a prophet going to Israel or a prophet speaking to Israel, it's those 10 northern backslidden tribes, right? What it also teaches is this. God is married to the backslider. And no matter how backslidden you are, and no matter what funky or foul place you are in, God, his goodness and mercy will still run us down. As King David said in Psalm 23, God is still sending prophets to this backslidden people, calling them back. 
So when you see a prophet was prophesying to Israel, it's the 10 northern tribes. Those 10 tribes did not repent though, so they went into captivity to who? The Assyrians. When you see a prophet prophesying to Judah, that represents the southern tribes that stayed, which actually was Judah, Benjamin, and then the Levites were there as well. They eventually went into captivity with who? With the Babylonians. Amos is ministering to Israel, to the north. Now, we've already painted a picture that this is a entire northern kingdom built on compromise, idol worship, perverse to the core. This is where Jezebel basically took over the throne as her weak husband Ahab, you know, was king. All of that took place in the north. You should start to be forming a dark picture in your mind of what the northern kingdom turned into. Remember Jesus said, if that darkness be in you, how great that darkness suddenly becomes. Darkness grows just as yeast grows, right? So he's sending Amos up to minister to them. And even though it's a dark place, and let's please just make sure we're taking all of this in as a foundation, even though the northern kingdom was very dark, by what we read in the Chronicles of the Kings and by what we read here in Amos, please follow this, they were wealthy, they were still having church services and still getting it popping. Did, did, did that kind of wake you up, you know, in the middle of all this, you know, historical chronicling, throw some slang out there? They were getting it popping. They had money. They had comfort. You're going to see in Amos him talking about God judging their summer homes and their winter homes, talking about them laying down in beds of ivory. They had money. They had ease and comfort. They had culture. They were a metropolitan arena. They had military might. And in fact, when Amos is ministering to them under the reign of Jeroboam, this is actually Jeroboam II, not the Jeroboam that, that led the 10 tribes to the north initially and erected the golden calf, but another Jeroboam generations later. This is Jeroboam II. They, had, they were at the peak of all of what they would be. Their military was amazing. As we're painting this picture, it should start reminding you of some place in the present. A place that's got no lack of religious activity, where the Barnes and Noble bookshelves have no lack of how to steer you in quote unquote religion. A place that has money, comfort, culture, military might, no lack of praise on Sundays. But what God sees is a lot of idolatry and a lot of darkness. God is raising up this fig picker <laughs> to go and speak to this group in this circle. The one who would be voted least likely to ever minister in that arena, this is the one God raises up. And God is also looking to raise up Amos' today who can reflect the truth of the gospel the light of the gospel and make the world know that God is the same and he has not changed. So let's begin reading. It says, the words of Amos, who was among the herdmen of Tekoa. Tekoa means pitching, as in pitching a tent. And what he's basically going to do is in the middle of everyone's very comfortable, regularly scheduled program, he brings in this prophet that pitches a tent in the middle of everything they're doing and says, God has something to say about all of this. He grew up overlooking the Dead Sea in Tekoa, and he knew very well where the region was that was once Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, it's believed that the southernmost rim of the Dead Sea, actually the Dead Sea should not be that long, but when God judged and decimated Sodom and Gomorrah, that actually the crater created from the fire and brimstone is what the Dead Sea just actually just naturally would fill in. So he grew up knowing that God is no joke. 
God is not a toy. God's judgment is real. And it's not a divine temper tantrum. It is a righteous expression of God who is light against darkness. It actually is God as a God of love because love is not perfected unless love is absolutely against what is destruct destructive to love. So he sends this man. The words of Amos, who was among the herdmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And he begins by saying, verse 2, the Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. Now, in case you think that's just like a really spiritual sounding intro, he sang a lot in that. Remember, the northern kingdom started saying that Zion was not where God was. They basically felt that if they created the right environment, that they could manipulate God into their compromising space. That's what we all need to be careful of. It says the Bible is wicked, and it also says the, the, the heart is wicked, rather, and the heart is deceitful. Our heart can deceive us into actually trying to fit God into our box instead of us looking at the Word of God to make sure that we're in God's box, if you follow what I'm saying. So he says here, the Lord will roar from Zion. What he's basically saying is, you can set up as many Samarias as you want. You can have as many golden calves. They can have the highest shine on them. You can have the most influential people coming and you can have a million attaboys on the back. But God is always who he says he is. God will always be worshiped in spirit and in truth. And if he's not worshiped in spirit and in truth, his presence will not be there. He's saying to them who were insisting that worship was in Samaria, that if you went to one of their services and said, yo, God's not here, they would have looked at you and been like, are you crazy? You see that praise team? Are you crazy? You see that golden calf? This is a modern, hey man, times change. You got to be relevant. You got to adapt with the times. Look at all the people. Look at the attendance in this place. If God wasn't about this, would we be as rich as we are? If God wasn't about this, would there be as many people here as there are? All the same traps that we could fall into today. Let me rephrase that. All the same traps that people are falling into today. That's what they would have said if you showed up and said, yo, I don't, God's not in this. And Amos comes and the first thing he says is, God has a word for you guys. And he's speaking from Zion. He's speaking from his place of truth, not the context you've created, no matter how pretty you've tried to make it. That should be sobering for all of us. Because it says in Isaiah 53 that all of us like sheep have gone astray. We have gone every one to his own way. And hey, as sheep, yes, we are prone to wander, but the scary thing is that our deceitful hearts can make the wandering place the new spiritual place. We will wander. Perhaps there's someone here today and in your heart you realize, I am wandering now. I am straying. I'm coming back to church. I want to hear a word from God. I want to give the Lord my heart, you know, like never before. But we need to realize, yeah, there is the danger of wandering so much and getting so used to wandering that you now are trying to make that into a new spiritual place and not feeling the need to return anywhere. He's coming and he's saying, no matter where you are, the Lord calls us back. And just like the father waiting for the prodigal, when we come back, he comes running to us. But he's saying, don't ever be confused into thinking that I'm in your Samaria. Don't ever be confused to thinking I'm in that golden calf. I am on my throne. I am in Zion. Zion represents the place where God abides. So Amos comes on the scene, and can you picture this? He comes in the midst of high society where everyone's just got their connections. Everyone's got their influence. Everyone's just trending and, 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 and so contemporary. Everyone's got their religious training and their education and their culture. And here comes this fig picker from the kind of place that if he even said where he was from, you might even have to ask him again, like, wait, what's your name again? Amos. Wait, but where are you from again? I'm sorry, I've just never heard of that. He was from a place that never came up at people's dinner tables. And this fig picker <laughs> with no formalized training, nothing trendy about him, shows up in the midst of high society and he's calling people back to God. But why is God doing this? God's doing this because he loves them. No matter where we stray, 
God is calling us back. David was out taking care of the sheep. And as he was tending to them and leading them and protecting them from the lion and the bear, one day it hit David. You know what? The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Yea, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because he's with me. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. You anoint my head with oil. And then he says, surely goodness and mercy will hunt me down all the days of my life. And the Hebrew word for, hunt, for, for seek after me is hunt me down. This is the Lord hunting down his backslidden people in the northern nation. So it says, the Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the habitations of the shepherds will mourn and the top of Carmel will wither. Then he begins in verse 3 and says, Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions to Damascus and for four. Would you please look at verse 6? Thus says the Lord, for tr three transgressions of Gaza and for four. Would you look at verse 9? For thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyrus and for four. Would you look at verse 13? Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of the children of Ammon and for four. Would you look at chapter 2, verse 1? Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Moab and for four. Just picture this for a moment. Here comes this unlikely man from an unlikely place in the middle of high society. He's a fig picker. He could tell you, and there's a certain way you would actually pinch a fig to kind of, you know, accelerate the ripening process. So he's a fig pincher and a fig picker, right? He shows up here in the midst of high society and basically he starts pronouncing judgments on all the Gentile nations around Israel. Can you imagine when he first came how popular he was? He was really popular at first. Here comes this guy and hey, who cares? You know, never mind. You know, he kind of, his hands are syrupy and sticky, I guess because he's always handling fruit or whatever, but you know, never mind all that. This dude is, is, is just going to town on the Gentile nations that we don't like. Say more, say more. But then can you imagine how their mouths drop when he then, after verse 4, look at chapter 2, verse 4, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Judah and for four. Mind you, because the northern kingdom was having a civil war with the southern kingdom, they were still digging that. Oh man, he's talking about God's judgment on the wicked Gentile nations. Now he's talking about Judah being off. We knew we were right. Yo, I'm liking this guy more every minute. And then chapter 2, verse 6, their mouths now drop as he says, for thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four. Starts out just going to town, pronouncing judgment on the Gentile nations, then goes to Judah, and then for the rest of the book, he is speaking of God's warning and God's judgment to Israel, the northern empire, if they don't repent. And he's hitting the nail on the head. Basically, for three transgressions and for four, we kept reading that, for three transgressions and for four, for three transgressions and for four, it's actually a Jewish idiom. We have an idiom here in American culture, right? What do we say from baseball? Three strikes and you're out. Their idiom was for three transgressions and for four. Basically, it speaks of God's mercy. It's saying basically that God is so merciful that even though three strikes and you're out is more than merciful when it comes to God. God says to his people, you will obey me. His people say, Lord, yes, we will obey you and serve no other gods but you. And then for his people to turn around and do whatever they want. God giving us three strikes is more than merciful. But he's so amazingly merciful. My, write down Micah chapter 7, verse 19. He delights in mercy. He gives four. He says, for three and for four, meaning you're at the plate, you're telling me one thing with your mouth, but your heart insists on worshiping idols. You tell me one thing with your mouth, but your heart insists on loving the world. You tell me you love me, but your actions insist on showing that you really don't care a thing about me. And even though it's three lobs over the plate, not curveballs, not knuckleballs, lobs over the plate, 
I'm still going to throw a fourth one over the plate. Why? Because love hopes all things. But he says now, and this is even with Gentile nations, I've given you three and now I'm giving you four. So basically, if you look at these six prophecies to these nations, every one of them was fulfilled literally. Amos is such a deep book because what it's showing you is this, and let's just, before we get more into Amos's ministry, let's just kind of look at, you know, God and what's being revealed of God in these two chapters. I think as Christians, sometimes we could fall in this trap. We know that we are children of light and that we have amended the word of God and that to whom much is given, much is required, Right? We know that the Bible says, and even Paul says, the things he did when he was living like a demon, he did it in ignorance because he was not enlightened to knowing Jesus was who Jesus is. Remember that? So I think oftentimes as believers, I've been guilty of this as well, we can develop this systematic theology where we basically say, okay, God is going to return one day and judge everything, right? Right? Clear. Matthew 25, Revelation 19, Revelation 20. The books will be opened and everything on Judgment Day will be revealed. Jesus said even every idle word spoken, right? So we could say when Jesus returns, everything will be judged. That's correct theology, yes? But sometimes we could fall into this trap of thinking that in the meantime, God is telling his church get right because we're the ones that quote unquote should know better. And the world is just doing what the world does, and the world better fix themselves before Judgment Day, right? All of that is true. But what Amos and these chapters comes in and ministers to us, that God is not just very much aware of what's going on. It says in the Psalms, he that made the ear, you don't think he hears everything going on on the, on, on the planet? He that made the eyeball, you don't think he sees everything going on on the planet? God is not only aware, but check this out. He's been judging nations and is currently judging nations even as we sit here. In hopes that even under those judgments, they may repent and spare themselves from the judgment day, which will end up in a lake of fire. Does that make sense? Have any of you fallen into that same trap where it's kind of like, okay, as believers, we should not be cruel because we know better. As believers, we should not lie and break treaties because we know better. We should not kill the innocents. And, you know, we stand against, of course, abortion because we know better, right? We should not, you know, oppress the poor because we know better. These things we should not do because we've tasted and seen that he is good. We have the Holy Spirit. We should know better. But with the, when the world does it, that's just what the world does. And it's heartbreaking and it's ugly, but that's what the world does. And God's aware and a judgment day is coming. That's all true. But let's add to that because the Bible makes clear that we are to add to that. Just as God judged Egypt and there's still a judgment day coming at his return. Just as God judged Babylon in Daniel chapter 5 and there's still a judgment day coming. God judged these nations Within a couple of centuries of Amos saying it, even though there is a judgment day coming, God is judge. And it doesn't just mean the judge eventually when Jesus returns. He is judge right now. He judges nations right now. He's running everything right now. And if any nations are moving in a direction and continuing, it is only God's mercy, but it's not because God is not active and it's definitely not because God does not notice. Are, are you following that? The things he's calling these nations out for, if you could please bring up Proverbs. Proverbs says this, six things the Lord hates, seven are repulsive to him. A proud look he hates. It's the attitude that makes one overestimate oneself and discount others. A lying tongue he hates. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that creates wicked plans. Feet that run swiftly to evil. A false witness who breathes out lies, even half-truths. And one who spreads discord or rumors among brothers. These are the seven things listed in Proverbs. 
when you study these judgments on these Gentile nations, and we're going to just walk through them quickly, what is he calling them out for? What did they do to bring this judgment on them? It's cruelty. It's the killing of innocents. It's the killing of children. You see a reference in these judgments to human trafficking, breaking treaties and lying. And you'd say, oh, no, 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 no. I guess I know with the judgment day to come, nations and people can be judged and will be judged for that. But God judging nations right now? Here's the other thing. As you study the fulfillment of these prophecies, these were not judgments brought on by natural disasters. Though that can happen, these were judgments brought on by God allowing other nations to come and attack and pillage and what have you. That should wake us up to realizing the extent of God's mercy being extended toward many nations right now. Even that what's being extended to our country. Amos is very fitting of where we live right now. Military might, par excellence if I can use that phrase, culture, lifestyle, religious activity at probably an all-time high. Notice I said religious activity. Not true revival, not true worship of God in Christ Jesus, but just religious activity. And God brings this Amos along. Let's just look at verse 3. It says, For thus says the Lord, for three transgressions to Damascus and for four. Damascus was the capital city of Syria. The first judgment, he arrives on the scene. Here comes this fig picker entering into the, the religiously trained circle, the high end circle, and he begins by pronouncing a judgment on Syria. And he says... I will not turn away the punishment thereof, verse 3, because they threshed Gilead with threshing instruments of iron. What God is saying and what this is speaking of is when the Syrians had attacked Gilead, they not only killed people, but once the people were dead, they took threshing instruments of iron and drug a plow over their bodies to grind up their body parts. Basically, what it's saying is that God looks at every nation right now, and God has a moral measuring device, and there's a time when God says enough's enough to any nation. Matter of fact, that lines up with Genesis 15, verse 6, when he says to Abraham, Abraham, your people are going to be enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. After that, I will bring them into the land of milk and honey, and then he says this, because the sins of the Amorites are not full yet. Who were the Amorites? Well, that was the capital city of Canaan. That's where the walls of Jericho were. These people performed human sacrifice. These people worshipped demons, obviously. And what's he saying to Abraham? I'm already aware of what they do, but I'm going to give them 400 more years until I say enough. And then, as we know, the Canaanites were judged and obliterated, and God actually used the Israelites to do it. You see, a lot of people will say, oh, God of the Old Testament is mean. I, that's why I like reading the New Testament, because the New Testament, the God is love. But in the Old Testament, he's the one you don't want to mess with. In the New Testament, Jesus is my homeboy, right? And all of this stuff. You don't see anyone walking around. You see all this Jesus is my homeboy paraphernalia. You don't really see anyone walking around with like God of Mount Sinai is my homeboy, right? Because people have kind of created that New Testament is soft God. Old Testament is rugged, raw, thug, thug God, holy thug God, you know, gangster God, right? all of this but what do you see when you read the old testament according to what it's really saying you see infinite mercy infinite mercy even towards the demon worshiper you see the heart of jesus father forgive them they don't even know the gravity of what they do you see love even the ten commandments when they're given in exodus chapter 20 yes he gives them ten commandments and then in Deuteronomy 8, he says, if you obey these blessings, if you don't obey, there will be curses upon you. That's Old Testament economy. But what does he say in Exodus chapter 20 before even announcing the first commandment? I am the Lord your God that rescued you from Egypt. Even the beginning of the Ten Commandments being issued is grace. 
I set my eyes on you. And what does it say in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7? The Lord did not pick you to be his people, O Israel, because you were a mighty people. Actually, you're the puniest of all the people on the planet, but the Lord picked you because I love you. So God runs things. God is the judge of the earth, and God is the active judge on the throne right now. Not just where now it's an empty throne that says God will sit here when Revelation 20 comes to pass. Can't we all fall in that trap? What should that produce in all of our hearts? Peace. That no matter what we see when we turn on CNN or the news, God is in control. What should that communicate? That evil is well accounted for, and that evil is in no way, quote unquote, winning. It is just God being merciful. As we're wondering, where's God while that's happening? In God's infinite wisdom, which we can't wrap our minds around, God is right there extending mercy because he does not delight in judgment, but judge he will if repentance does not happen. So he's saying that Damascus, three strikes, Four strikes, now I'm judging. And why? What was it that tipped me over the edge? What tipped me over the edge was when you were not just doing your normal form of wickedness, but that you actually went to the level of digging up bodies from war and just you weren't content to just, you know, there'd be fallout in a war, but you wanted to take dead bodies, line them up, and grind them to pieces with iron plowing equipment. That was enough. When will God finally say to America, that's enough? I think it was Billy Graham who said that if God does not judge America soon, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 says that the Holy Spirit is acting as a restraining agent. You see, we live in a time and in a culture where many would just say, I wish the church would just get out of here. You know, we live in a day of relativism. Do you, if it feels good, do it. Frank Sinatra said, I did it my way. Burger King says, have it your way. Reebok says, this is my planet. You know, just do it. All this, and here we're coming and saying, no, 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 it's according to what God says. No, 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 it's not relativism, it's absolutes, and God is the absolute, and the world is like, whoa, you are a party pooper talking that language. Would you just disappear? Or, or better yet, if you're going to stay, just stay in the four walls of your building. Just don't come out t telling about God's love and God's rules or nothing. But do you know that we are the reason why judgment has not come upon this country? Because we're salt and light. We're his agents. And remember when the Lord brought destruction on Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham was petitioning with him? The Lord said, even if there's five righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, I will not destroy it even for five, which says two things. One, he couldn't even find five people in Sodom and Gomorrah. Two, that the Lord will spare his judgment just if there's just a handful of people calling on his name. What are we sparing this country of? Because we're here with our prayer meetings. The church is here. And oh yeah, there's a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing and a lot of weird stuff that's going on in the name of Christ. But didn't Jesus already tell us that would happen? Didn't he already tell us in 2 Peter 3 that there'd be false prophets preaching for money and it would make people hate the name of Jesus? Didn't he already tell us that there'd be wolves in sheep's clothing? Didn't he already say that there would be hidden coral reefs when we're sailing on this journey? People saying they're brothers and sisters, but they're not clouds without water, trees without fruit. He said all of this. But then we say it, we fall to pieces. Oh, I'm not going to church anymore. Why? Because of all the hypocrisy. Wait, he already told us everything. And then he said in John 13, I'm telling you these things before they happen so that when they happen, you'll remember that I am who I say I am. God is in control. Time won't allow us to go through all of these prophecies. You say, go ahead. Verse 6, for thus says the Lord to Gaza. Now he's just moved from Syria to Gaza, which is the Philistine territory. And by the way, the prophecy that he gives against Damascus was fulfilled when he raised up the Assyrians to come and conquer the Syrians. Now, verse 6, he's speaking to the Philistines. 
And he's saying, verse 6, for three transgressions that Gaza did, the capital city of the Philistines, and for four, I will not turn away my punishment. Because they carried away captive the whole captivity to deliver them up to Edom. This is speaking of taking a mass of captured people and moving them from one place by force to another place they'd never want to go, subjecting them to what they would have never chosen. This is what we would refer to as human trafficking. Verse 7, I will send a fire on the wall of Gaza. It will devour the palaces. Verse 8, I will cut off the inhabitants from Ashdod. And then goes on and on. This was also fulfilled by him using the Assyrians in 730-ish B.C. Now are you understanding why Habakkuk had to pray to God? Because he was like, God, I got to talk to you about something. I understand you're holy. I understand you run things. I understand you are God Almighty. I understand you will judge nations. But he says, I'm wrestling with how you will sometimes use a more wicked nation than the nation being judged to come in and bring punishment on them. Now you understanding? Because what is God doing here? He's judging these Gentile nations. Everything's being fulfilled to the T, but he's using the wicked Assyrians to actually do it. And then he will judge them too, which is what he tells him. Yeah, does this really show that God runs absolutely everything and that no one gets away with a thing and that God sees and knows it all and that even if he uses a wicked nation to judge another wicked nation, God's not the author of the sin. He's just allowing it to run its normal course. He's permitting it to happen, but they're still responsible because they chose the sin anyway. Sounds like the one that knows everyone's thoughts before they even come and controls absolutely everything. Somebody might say, well, because there's so much evil in the world, I have a hard time resting in God's sovereignty. Well, as ugly as evil is, and the Bible calls it a mystery because there are some things we can't wrap our minds around that we see happen in this world. It's way bigger than these finite brains of ours, right? But what I say and what the Bible leads us to know is that evil actually further shows how sovereign God is. Because to have a devil running loose who seeks to steal, kill, and destroy, and God is still running everything, where a bird still can't fall to the ground without his permission, and God still is using all things to work together for good, that actually just underscores his sovereignty even more. Verse 9. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyrus and for four, I will not turn away your punishment because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom. We just read that. Verse 13, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of the children of Ammon and for four, I will not turn away the punishment because they ripped up the women with the child of Gilead that they might enlarge their border. Here there is a judgment for killing women and children in the name of conquest and war. Verse 14, I will kindle a fire in the wall of Rabbah. Chapter 2, verse 1, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Moab, this is modern day Jordan, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because he burned the bones of the king of Edom into lime. So what was God's tipping point with ancient Jordan? That when they came and captured and conquered this other region, they weren't content to just win the battle. They decided to go to the graveyard, dig up the bones of kings that had reigned before them, and burn the bones down into garden fertilizer. And God said, you know what? That's absolutely enough. What you're seeing is God that sees everything going on. Eight billion people on planet Earth, more nations than we could count, wars and rumors of wars, things that go on in the light, things that go on in the dark, the red zones of every different city, the dark things going on in the furthest corners, to from India to China to all. God sees everything. And what we perceive as a lack of activity, one, God's more active than we realize. God is on the throne, Habakkuk 2.20, saying, let all the earth be quiet, meaning you can't hear what I'm saying and you can't perceive what I'm communicating from my word if you're doing all the talking. 
Be still, be quiet. I sit on my throne and I'm not only the judge of all the ends of the earth, but I am currently judging and moving nations and arranging everything. And in the midst of it, still bring, using all of it to bring people to call on the name of Jesus. How many of you came to the Lord through calamity? How many of you came to the Lord through God permitting all, you know, the dams, if you will, to bust open and all the floods to go over your head? Well, multiply that magnify that so much greater on a worldwide scale and you can now get an idea knowing that God doesn't change what he's doing through nations to do what to bring him glory as the redeemer as people are getting saved and calling on his name who apart from calamity many would not call on his name what does it say you know in lamentations in your afflictions you will seek me early he's using evil to serve his purpose but he's not the author of evil and evil will be judged you know christians are the only ones that have an answer for evil in our worldview you speak with the taoist they will say that there's yin and there's yang there's sun and there's moon there's light and there's dark it's in a perpetual conflict that's what it means when you see that circle with the yin and the yang wrapped around it. it's a perpetual conflict of good and evil and it's all about the best we can offer you is balance balance Take the good with the bad. When the bad comes, just know akuna matata. Good days are, must be around the corner. And the longer your bad days, the more you should be excited. Why? It's all about balance. What it's basically saying is live with it. And there's no hope in that. But you come to the Christian worldview. We know exactly all of what God reveals about evil. One, we know its source. We know that evil is personal. We know that it is intelligent. We know that it is highly organized. We also know that Jesus came down to bring judgment upon the devil on the cross, that the resurrection signed Satan's death papers. And we know that evil has an end. And when Christ returns, long gone will be the days during the millennial reign where anyone will have to say, when you walk down this street, watch out for this. And oh, it's getting dark, be home before dark because evil has an end. We're the only ones that have an answer for evil in our worldview. Let's go to chapter six and then we're gonna to start to wrap this up. Do you see what a meaty book Amos is? And please pray for me, because look, it's one thing to unpack a chapter before you get up in front of the congregation. But when you're sitting in front of some of these books, you're like to teach this in an hour, what do you pick? And how do you get up and teach it before going down a rabbit trail of so much meat that you look up at the clock on the back wall and two and a half hours done went by? So pray for me on Saturday nights. But do you see how meaty this book is? Look at what God does. He takes a fig picker with no education, no training, no influence, brings him to quote unquote high society and not only that, but he uses this uneducated man to write one of the most brilliantly composed books of the Old Testament. Look at the rhythm of the book. Look at the idioms and how it's just a play on words. Look at chapter four. He says, hear this word, ye kind of Bashan. You know what he just called the people? He called them, he goes to northern Israel in the midst of their wine and cheese party, and he says, thus says the Lord, I'm here because God loves you, but I have to tell you what God sees. You're just a bunch of fat cows fattening yourself for the slaughter. That's what he's speaking to. He's speaking of just them eating compromised in sin and begging for God, tempting God. Will God do anything about it? And he says, it's just like eating all of that and you're just fattening yourself up for judgment. You're asking for something. Is it a little warm in here? No? All right, if so, get the, get the fans on. Maybe it's just me with these nice hot lights, whatever. But look at this, verse 6. I've given you cleanness of teeth. It means chapter four, verse six, I sent famine to you to wake you up. But look at the end of the verse, yet you've not returned to me, says the Lord. Verse seven, I withheld rain from you to try to wake you up. But look at the end of verse eight, but you have not returned unto me. 
I've smitten you with mold and fungus on your crops. But look at the end of verse 9. But you have not returned unto me, says the Lord. Verse 10, I sent you pestilence like I did in Egypt. But look at the end of verse 10. But you have not returned to me. Verse 11, I've overthrown some of you, but you've not returned unto me. Then he even says this. I've even allowed the locust, verse 9, and remember we read about that with Amos, he allowed a locust plague to even come, but yet you've not turned unto me. Look at Amos penning this book that not only unpacks so much meat. How many of you feel today that your systematic theology just got yanked from every direction and just stretched larger than what you've been operating with? That when you now look at the New York Times, the LA Times, Washington Post, whatever your BBC, whatever it is, you now will look at it in a new way, knowing that God is fully in control, that nothing escapes, and that God is not only looking at a judgment day to come, but he is currently bringing judgment all around us. And how merciful he is to see how many nations are begging for it, including our own. And with all of that, he speaks to his people. And would you look at verse 4 of chapter 5? Thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live. Look at verse 6. Seek the Lord and live. Look at verse 12. I know your manifold transgressions. I know your mighty sins, Israel. You are afflicting the just. He's saying, now remember when he first showed up, and here comes the fig picker with the sticky hands from the desert, and he's pronouncing a woe on all the Gentile nations. Yeah, they take bribes. They oppress the poor. They're cruel for no reason. They kill innocents. They kill babies. Now he's speaking to them and saying, you're oppressing. You're acting just like them. I know your sins. You take a bribe. You turn aside the poor from the gate. People are coming for help. People are saying, I have a need, and you're turning them away. You're despising the poor. Verse 14, seek good and not evil so that you can live. Even with all of this, even with him saying, I'm trying to wake you up and you refuse to wake up, he's still begging them, it's not too late. Choose personal revival. Do you know what that communicates if we bring it to a personal level? That you are, if you still are breathing right now, no matter what's going on in your life, you are just one sincere, broken heart's cry away from personal revival. This magnifies God's omnipotence. This magnifies God's justice. This magnifies God's wrath against wickedness. But it also magnifies the heart of the gospel, the love of God. And anyone in these nations, just like Rahab the harlot, when judgment was coming on the demon-worshipping, human-sacrificing Canaanites, a prostitute named Rahab made the decision at the 11th hour I believe truth and I'm willing to walk away from everything and I want to worship the true and living God. Anyone in any nation can call on the name of the Lord at any moment and live. But it's also saying to us as people at any point of our hard-hearted, hard-headed, backslidden state, at any moment you could call on the name of the Lord. Now to bring this right into our present day, how many of you are in a place today where you know you need personal revival. You know you need it. You have accurately assessed where you are. You know you're loving the world. You know you're chasing the world. You know you're indifferent to the things of God. You didn't need to come to church today to know that you're off in your thinking and off in your behavior. But maybe the wall you're hitting is, will God still do it? Will God still meet me? Is it too late? You don't know how many times I've walked in and gotten personal revival and walked outside and just squandered it. Can I still feel that joy? What did David say after he committed adultery and murder? Lord, make me hear gladness again. There's some here this morning, this afternoon, you're wondering, is the, okay, I know once saved, always saved, if you really belong to him. I know, I know, but am I past the point of being able to hear gladness? Have I just, I know I'm his kid, but have I, am I the kid that's perpetually worn out my welcome? I've played religion for so long. I've known so much theology up here while not doing anything with it here. 
Is it too late for me to start a ministry? Okay, I know, I know, I know. There's always room for ministry. Is it too late? I have so downplayed the supernatural. Is it too late for me to not only start a ministry, but have a supernatural, God-infused ministry? This book speaks hope to whatever place we are in, period. But the one thing he speaks out, and this is where this will be my third closing, chapter 6. He says, Woe to them that are in, at ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria. Now, we have to unpack that, right? Because didn't Jesus say that if we come to him, even though we are labored and weary, we'll find rest? Doesn't the Lord speak of us resting in him? Doesn't it say in Zephaniah that we rest and he also rests in his love for us? So if the Bible speaks about rest and comfort, and the Holy Spirit is called the comforter, then why would God say, woe to those that are at ease? I thought that this Christian walk is to be characterized by ease because Jesus is carrying the heavy yoke for us. Why would he pronounce a woe on that? It's obviously a different type of ease. This is referring to the false comfort of trusting in the wrong things. The false comfort of trusting just in the music playing. The false comfort of just trusting in, well, I know so much about the Lord. The false comfort of, of course I love the Lord. Look how many theology books I have. The false comfort of, of course I love the Lord. Do you know the name of my church and what my church does? Of course. You know, did you hear about who my grandfather was? Are you aware of what my mother did for the kingdom? Woe to those that are resting in the wrong things. Mere religious ceremonies and routines, resting in resumes and who you know and where you go and how many people greet you when you walk into the workplace. Woe to those that are at ease in their sin, at ease in their compromise. And because all the world is giving you nothing but love, because the compromised church is giving you nothing but love, you're saying it must be because I'm blessed. When actually it's just God's mercy and God sees that there's no repentance inside of us, there's no brokenness inside of us, and there's no self-examination. We're just busy hoping everyone else examines themselves, right? When we sit with the Lord, it's just to talk about other people. You know, Lord, I'm here to talk to you tonight. And you know, you know, you know, I'm bringing some people before you, Lord. This person, she's always off, but she don't know it. This guy, he thinks he's all of that, but he's really not. Would you humble him, Lord? Would you break him? But, but love him, love him. I know you don't love him. You know her, you know, I don't know where she's been. And then you get up and you're like... I feel revival coming. Put on praise music. Call you. Oh, I was interceding for so many souls. You, you, oh, you and, and God is not even in the midst of that. He talks about the Pharisee and the publican. The Pharisee says, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like other people. I pay tithes. I fast twice a week. And then next to him was the publican that just hit himself on the chest and was like, Lord, I'm a sinner. Just, just be merciful to me. Jesus said, which one of them was heard by God? Woe to those that are at ease in Zion. Woe to those that are just resting in the wrong things. Matter of fact, isn't that the same thing Jesus says in Revelation 3 to the lukewarm church? You are at ease saying that I'm rich, I'm increased with goods, I lack nothing. And he says, you don't even realize that you're wretched, poor, miserable, blind, and naked. Woe to those that are lukewarm. Woe to those that are at ease. And look, as believers, Christ took the wrath on the cross in our place. So it's not speaking of a wrath on God's people, but it's definitely speaking of being lukewarm and making him nauseous and us missing out on what he has for our life. I mean, how many of us get excited when we hear Jesus say, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life and have abundant life. Don't we all get on the edge of our seat? Hey, meet us next Sunday. The sermon will be on abundant life and how it can be yours in five quick points, right? Bring a friend. I don't even have to mention we're serving or frying fish afterwards because we all are so excited for any conversation centering around abundant life. What makes Christian life exciting is and it's not just being saved from hell. It's not just going to heaven, but it's being able to live a different kind of life here and now. And what he's saying is, woe to those that are at ease in Zion. Woe to those that aren't troubled. 
that they skip this or skip that. Woe to those that aren't even troubled that they don't serve the kingdom the way God's calling them to. Woe to those that want to do everything and be current on everything in this information age, but are way behind, are not current in examining their own hearts and doing business with God. Woe to those that are more into what people think of them than what God knows about them. Why? Because you will miss out on what God has for you. He says in chapter 6, verse 4, that lie on beds of ivory. Now, it doesn't mean if you have an ivory bed at home that you have to go home and put it on Facebook Marketplace and somehow get like a burlap bed and show how spiritual you are. You know, it's not the things you have. It's when the things you have have you. It's not what you possess. It's when the things you possess actually possess you, right? They lie on beds of ivory. They stretch themselves on their couches. They eat the lambs out of the flock. They eat the calves out of the midst of the stall. They chant to the sound of the violin. They invent to themselves instruments of music like David. They drink wine in bowls. Basically, it's just all about doing you and whatever feels good for you and never stopping to say, what brings pleasure to God with my life? Then he says in chapter 6, verse 12, and let's have the worship team come up. Shall horses run on a rock? He says, do you ever see horses? Would anyone gallop horses on a jetty, a rocky jetty by the ocean? Who would do that? Will one plow the sea with oxen? Have you ever imagined like, okay, if I want to get in some nice dirt and move my hand through the dirt, I'll leave a little trough, if you will, right? But what happens if you do that in water? Or do, what, do you leave a path in the water? Or does the water close right behind your hand? What he's saying is, to my people who are always living like the grass is greener, Look at this. Shall horses run on a rock? No. Shall someone try to plow the ocean with an oxen? No. But you've turned my judgment into bitterness. And you've turned the fruit of righteousness into poison. He's saying, you treat my precepts, my word, and my heart like it's a poisonous thing. You turn up your nose at knowing me more. You turn up your nose at what I offer like someone's offering you bitter poison. But meanwhile, you're looking at the world like it's greener out there. But yet, would you chasing the world out there it would be like you thinking it's wise to gallop a horse on craggy rocks? How many would do that? Or you setting out to plow and plowing the ocean? He's calling his people back. Now do you see why in chapter 10, the false high priest of Samaria, it says Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, and said, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear his words. They basically said, this dude with no Facebook friends, no Twitter following, no formalized training, this fig picker from the desert. He's come here and he's changed everything. The whole land can't handle, the land, never mind one person, this kingdom cannot handle the weight of what he's just come and said to us. Let's bring up five points about ministry and then that'll be my fourth and final closing. One, God has picked each of us and with that, God has also picked each of our ministries. John 15, 16, write that down. Ephesians 2, 10, it says he's already written out our life as workmanship, the Greek word poema. He's already written out our life and our ministry like a poem. He's picked us, but he's also picked each of our ministries. He picked Amos, a fig picker, and he picked his ministry to go to a place where everyone would say, that kind of person would never go there, that kind of person would never be effective there, that kind of person would never be embraced there. God picks each of us and he picks our ministries. God's been preparing us for our specific ministry or ministries all of our lives, making full use of the good and the bad. When he grew up in Tekoa and he's looking out over the cliff and he every morning sees not only the beautiful Dead Sea, but sees where Sodom and Gomorrah used to be. 
He doesn't need to get Nat Geo or look at History Channel to know if Sodom and Gomorrah was really destroyed. He sees that God's judgment is real. Even in the smallest everyday things of his childhood, he was being prepared to go and speak to the north about God judging all the nations around them. God's been preparing each of you for your ministry all of your life. Jeremiah 1.5, he says to Jeremiah, before you were even born, when you were in the womb, I already ordained you to be my prophet. 2 Corinthians 1.4, it says God comforts us in all of the trials of our life so that we could turn around and comfort others. That's why usually the best people to minister to someone who's lost a child, God forbid, when well, we're speaking of God's sovereignty, meaning in God's plan, is someone who's also lost a child. The best person to minister to someone who's been widowed is someone who's received that comfort from God already where they have previously been widowed. God chooses all of our ministries. Point three, sometimes the ministry God has for us will make clear sense. Sometimes it'll make sense. Paul grew up at the feet of Gamaliel, was a member of the Sanhedrin. It makes perfect sense that after he got saved, he would have the ministry to the Jewish people in every city he would go to. But then sometimes it will seemingly not make clear sense. Joseph was raised in a prison to be the second person of most influence in the world. Moses was raised in a palace to lead God's people in a desert. Sometimes it will make clear sense. Sometimes it will not make seemingly clear sense. But God knows best our jobs to be surrendered and flexible. Job 23.10, Job says, I don't know what he's doing with my life, but I know that he knows what he's doing with my life. And when he's done with me, I will shine like gold. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 25, the foolishness of God is still wiser than man. The, wisdom, the strength of God is still stronger than, the weakness of God is stronger than the strength of men. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. God is never looking for ability or resumes, but hearts that are humble and sold out for him. Here's the last point, and this could turn into another message, but I already said it's my fourth and final closing. The local church is to be the place where all of our spiritual gifts and ministry are affirmed, sharpened, and covered in prayer. Like, what's the biblical basis for that? Because, you know, when we don't want to serve in our church and don't want to hang out in church much, we want to know. Whenever we don't like something, we want to know the verses, right? <laughs> Lord, Lord is a merciful God. Galatians 6.10. Do good to all men. Because some people are like, no, you don't understand. My ministry is out there. That's why you don't see me in church a lot. My ministry is global, man. That's why you don't see me a lot. That's why when I'm in town, I'm asleep. That's why I don't come to church. Well, okay, but the Bible says, do good to all men. Oh, so you are going out in the world to do good to all men, but it says, especially those that are of the household of faith. It's saying no matter what people group you're called to and what circle he's calling you to give your life, your brothers and sisters and your brothers and sisters in your local church are to be the ones that get the especially. Are you giving out especiallys? Okay, you're great at the workplace. Oh, you're great at your job. People can't get enough of you. But are you living out the especially life where you're doing good to all men, you're only obeying half the verse, but it says especially to those that come in your church with you on Sunday and those that call on the name of the Lord. Deep verse. 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14 is two chapters of the Bible given out of how to know what your spiritual gift is, how to know the ministry God has for you, and how to operate and grow and be affirmed and prayed for in your local church service so that you can go out into the world equipped. So as I looked at this message, it's like, Lord, is this a message on you as judge or is this a message on ministry points? And the Lord, I pray, has conveyed both. Amen? So, look, this is a meaty book. Please go and read it on your own. Um, whenever you see the world seemingly coming apart at the seams, and it seems like it's just all bets off, sometimes we feel that way. You look at the news. It's like, is it just all bets off? I know God's real, but it just seems like it's, it, that happened in this city, this happened here, and this here, and a shooting here, and this here. Is it just all bets off? I know everything is father filtered, but just like sometimes there could be a hole in the screen and mosquitoes are getting in the porch, 
God, is there, are there holes in the screen? Is the enemy just sneaking some stuff in? Amos is here among other places of the Bible to remind you that God is in full control, that God not only is the judge to sit on the throne when he returns, but he's judge right now and he is judging right now. He is extending mercy at the same time in just the right measure. But God has a tipping point. Just as he said in Genesis 15, 16, just as we see in Amos when he says, you know what? I've been extending mercy to this nation. I've been extending mercy here. That's enough and brings judgment. But even in the midst of that, whoever calls on the name of the Lord, whoever calls on the name of the Lord. So you hear stories of 9-11 and the jets coming in, which were just large bombs flying at what, 500 miles per hour. And the man with the Bible on his desk and all everything blew up all around him. And the Bible is somehow preserved and the man's life is spared in some way. Even in the midst of the whirlwind, God is still in full control. So let's look to God now. Let's worship him. This is also when, as we share, it's not the credits to the movie, but this is when we continue in worship by also giving an offering to the Lord, which he takes 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 and other portions to even speak about God loving a cheerful giver, and that it's a time of worship. It's not just paying the bills. Oh, time to pay the bills, time to keep the lights on. No, no, no. It is worship, where Jesus even saw a woman give a quarter of a penny as he sat by the treasury of the temple and said, this woman's given more than everyone else because she gave all of her heart with it. Amen. So let's worship God now. Let's receive this afternoon's offering, and let's think about ministry. I pray that Amos has a lot of people here excited about getting into ministry and excited about walking in the ministry God has for you in a whole new way. I pray that Amos has come along today and no longer, when you feel God leading you, and I think someone here needed to hear this, God's calling someone here to do something, but you're continuing to tell God all of the reasons you can't possibly do that kind of ministry because you don't have what the world says are the right qualifications. Will you let him use you like an Amos who will not only be used mightily, but then in the process will not even with no literary training pen one of the most amazing books in all of the Old Testament? I imagine if he were in a certain circle and God said, I need an amazing author, I don't think his hand would have gone up first. He would have been like, I'm just a fig picker. And yet, all he did is brought his heart and God uses him to do more than he can imagine. Amen? So a lot to chew on today, right? A lot to chew on. Father, thank you so much for your word this morning. So much to chew on, but God, we just thank you for speaking to us. And now, Lord, will we, will we do our part with it now? Will we take our daily bread and ingest it, thoroughly digest it and assimilate it before we go out into that world and decide we want to digest other things with our regularly scheduled program? Lord, would you give this word staying power in our hearts? Lord, we repent, Lord, of trusting in the wrong things. We repent, Lord, of trusting in status quo, finding safety in numbers. We repent, Lord, of rewriting your righteous requirements for your people. We repent, Lord, of lukewarmness. We repent of indifference and apathy. And Lord, we also want to take our rightful place and pray for our city, that you'd be merciful to this city, Lord. Lord, we want to take our right part in praying for our state and our country, that you would be merciful, Lord, to our wicked country, Lord, and the things that are done and the things that are permitted and calling light darkness and darkness light, calling sweet bitter and bitter sweet, just as Isaiah said to the Israelites. We want to pray for our country, for mercy, Lord God. And the Lord, you would bring people to you through your mercy, just as you brought us to you. Lord, we pray for nations around the world, Lord. We don't delight in the judgment upon the wicked, as you said in Ezekiel 33. We delight in hearing that people are calling on your name. Lord, we pray that people around the world would call on your name before they perish. Lord God, give us praying hearts. We want to see what you see, and we want to pray as you'd want us to pray as we walk around this earth. Thank you, Lord. We love you in Jesus' name. And Lord, we pray you'd receive this offering this afternoon as worship.
from us to you. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Let's